all men by nature desire to know. There are certain instances or certain methodologies according to which you can lay hold of the truth with a kind of stable and permanent certainty because you've seen the principles and the conclusions and the conclusions and the principles and you've shown how they are related. Today we are talking about how do we know what we know? And I think this is really going to be a helpful framework for so many of our episodes and conversations. Yeah, we've been talking with uh, philosophers, theologians, and scientists, and they're all searching for, for knowledge of certain things. And how can we justify that we know certain things? And we're asking these questions to one of the best, a Dominican priest, Father Gregory Pine, is obviously Dominican priest once you see his white habit in just a few minutes. And he currently serves as an adjunct professor of dogmatic theology at the Dominican House of Studies here in Washington, D.C., and assistant director of the Thomistic Institute. He's author of Prudence, Choose Confidently, Live Boldly. He's also become quite the familiar face and voice in the Catholic podcast sphere. This area of how do we know is epistemology. He's He's got some very good thoughts and interesting uh, thoughts about that that I think help frame, you know, um, you know the, the whole uh, relationship between science and, and theology and, and philosophy. So. And this perceived conflict uh, between scientific revision and objective truth, that's really kind of the heart of our conversation. Again, a really engaging conversation. So let's go now to our conversation with Father Gregory Pine. Father Gregory Pine, thanks so much for joining us. I've had the joy of meeting you a few times in Washington, D.C., but you and Dr. Dan Keebler go back to your Franciscan University days. I ran cross-country at Franciscan University of Steubenville, um, although only for a short period of time on account of the fact that I wasn't good. Uh, That's and not I'll, true. <laughs> and also on account of the fact that, um, yeah, I got excited about other things. Yeah, well, it's great to have you on and uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. Me as well. And, you know, something that I'm really interested in talking to you about that we both are is this reoccurring topic that comes up in Purposeful Lab and that there's often this perceived conflict uh, between scientific revision and objective truth. And that's really what we want to delve in today with you. You know, we've spoken with a wide range of experts on various topics from astrochemists to paleontologists. And yet there remains this uncertainty as to whether the universe and ourselves are knowable at all. Why might the philosophy of knowledge be helpful here in this case and for examining this question more deeply? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I have a variety of thoughts. Maybe some first thoughts are uh, we say certain in different ways, and I think that's helpful to kind of address at the outset. So I think our, our standard or paradigm for certainty is mathematical certainty uh, or absolute certainty or speculative certainty, however you want to describe it, the certainty of two plus two equals four. But then there are other certainties uh, that we're conscious of at some level, but don't necessarily engage with uh, as rigorously. So like what you might call moral certainty or practical certainty. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's basically the case. Now there might be exceptions and I could sit here and envision or imagine what they could be. But, you know, that's that's basically the case. And I think that, um, you know, in, in scientific inquiry, we're typically dealing with nature. There could be some genetic mutation or there could be some um, error as to like measurement. And as a result of which we need to provide some space for that without undermining certainty wholly and entirely, as if there were but two options, absolute mathematical speculative certainty and then chaos <laughs> on the other hand. So I think that you know, what, what this type of observational science affords is often something along the lines of a kind of practical certainty or moral certainty insofar as there are these other factors which weigh in and which need to be considered in evaluation and judgment. But yeah, I think that's, that's kind of helpful at the outset. Yeah. So when you talk about like scientific certainty or scientific knowledge, you know, how does it vary like in terms of the way you get at it epistemologically as opposed to theological knowledge, right? Is, is, is there's is there some overlap there and the way we know anything, right? But but how do you how, how does one get to one and 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 the other in in sort of different ways? Theologian is often accused, both by scientists and by atheists, of being irresponsible. Insofar as he says, 
yep, this is the case. And then he posits some black box claim, which admits of no verifiability or falsifiability, but just is because his God tells him that it is. And then just drives a hard line from that point of point of entry. And I think that like when you start with a kind of philosophy of knowledge or certain epistemological principles, you can say, all right, we have a nature. Uh, that already is a big claim, but at the very least, you can observe that human beings tend to follow a similar groove in their living of human life. As so, in a kind of ancient or classical conception of nature, we would say that nature is um, a principle of motion or rest and that to which it pertains per se and per actions. People listening are like, what the heck? <laughs> Father Gregory is like, what the heck? I memorized a definition, pat on the back. Um, no, but the idea is that nature is a basis both of being and of becoming. So it's a basis of identity and of mission, to speak in somewhat more popular terms. And because our nature is what it is, it sets the trajectory for how we act, how we behave, how we comport ourselves, not only in a moral way, or as we are inclined to think about morality, but also in a, an intellectual way or a speculative way. Uh, so because we are this type of thing, we're going to inquire into reality with this type of confidence or with this type of approach. And I think that what you observe, again, at the outset is that all men by nature desire to know. So there's something in us which says, here, when I approach reality, it's going to yield up some of its intelligibility because my nature has communicated to that me with a kind of certainty. Um, and that when I do so, often I find fruitfully, uh, or often I find, um, you know, like propitiously, that this is the case. Um, so if you approach from a disposition of, of radical skepticism, you can actually complicate things for yourself in the sense that, you know, you walk out your front door and you say, um, all right, the train schedule, which I looked up on my phone prior to departure, is probably the case because the people at the Washington Metro Area Transport Authority aren't seemingly motivated to deceive me. Right. And, and because while there may be intervening circumstances or causes that could otherwise uh, delay the train, it's probably going to obtain. So I can conduct my course with that anticipation and say to the people whom I'm meeting in Old Town Alexandria, I'll see you at 12.15. But I can say those things, whereas if I approach it with radical skepticism and doubt, I actually, I make it difficult for myself to live because I'm like, I need to arrive two hours early and I'll just be at the public library around the corner. So that way I can, it's just like, holy smokes, you know? So dot, dot, dot. I'm always radically skeptical of the Washington Metro <laughs> system, but so getting back to, you know, this question of how do we know what we know, I want to go back to a basic question that people ask is how can we trust our senses? How can we trust our basic senses and know we're not just living in a matrix? Yeah, right. So, um, so with any first principles, you can't typically prove them uh, in a demonstrative sense, but you can show dialectically that if you don't hold for them, then your life is weird. Um, so like the principle of non-contradiction in the speculative order that a thing can both be and not be in the same order in the same respect, um, you, can't, you can't prove that. Uh, so there's a voice in the tradition who says, for those who deny it, they don't need a proof, they don't need an argument, and they need to be beaten and then ask whether it is not the same to be beaten and not beaten, you know, because there's a way in which reality reinforces its intelligibility and its integrity. And so when it comes to like approaching reality with a certain confidence that reality is as it projects itself, that, that's just, it's just sensible. So like in the first way, the first proof for the existence of God, St. Thomas just says, motion is evident to the senses. Basically stuff changes. We observe that to be the case. Now, even if we were deceived in our vision, at the very least, there's a change in our perception. And so that's a change. So things are still changing and that's the only starting point upon which we can subsequently reason in making the first way and still get the goods. And so I think that, you know, like a lot of people tie themselves in knots or perform very difficult me mental gymnastics as a way by which to say, you know, you can't possibly argue on the basis of this, but it's like, we're all starting somewhere. You know, everyone admits certain brute facts and I'm choosing these brute facts because they correspond, whatever, however you would describe it, but they, they seem to correspond to my experience. So. I would say simply like, I'm not going to prove to you that we don't live in the matrix. Um, I believe certain things about God, about Christ, about the sacramental order, which make it really hard for me to believe that anything like that is even remotely plausible. But um, my life lived in this non-matrix-like trajectory for the past however many years. Um, it's, it's, born, it's born fruit in the sense that 
if I approach reality in this way, reality tends to interact with me and I with it in fruitful, propitious ways. So I think, I think often it's like that. So when people say, you have to prove this, you can push back on them and say, no, not necessarily. You know, maybe that's part of it. Yeah. It's almost like you have to show me how you live without that first principle. And it, when you think about science, right? Science, you can't do science without assuming certain truths adhere to, to the world. You have to have faith in certain things, not necessarily God, but you, you can't get science off the ground without having, uh, you know, you, you belief that like you can rely upon your senses, that there's actually a real world out there, right? And so science relies upon a lot of the things that you're talking about. These first principles even get going, right? And, and that, you know, and then science seems to work, right? It seems to make sense and, and, and cohere with, you know, what you see and what we talk, you know, what you talk about your perception of reality, they seem to cohere in a way that makes sense uh, that uh, if, if, you know, you have this radical skepticism, we got to explain why does, <laughs> why do scientists here and over here see the same sort of phenomenon and see the same thing, right? Maybe just another way of saying it is uh, some contemporary philosophers will say, there's no view from nowhere, right? So there's, it's, it's always a view from somewhere. So we can, you know, sound the death knell on the Enlightenment project, this idea of perfect kind of pristine um, impartiality. It's, it's just not. And so, okay, so there are going to be certain errors which can arise in our ob observing of or observation of reality and then our reasoning upon it. So you just think about observing reality. There might be something wrong with me. Right. I could just, I could be colorblind. And as a result of which, I'm not going to be able to distinguish between red and green. And that's a problem. Okay, cool. Now, there might be something with the intervening medium. All right. So I'm looking at uh, pennies and nickels and dimes at the bottom of a fountain. And I'm trying to judge the level of oxidation on whatever, doesn't matter. But, you know, there's a certain quality of light and it's being refracted by the water at a certain angle. And as a result of which, I'm also potentially mistaken about particulars. So like the medium could also be getting in the way. And then there could be a problem with the thing itself that I'm, that I'm observing. Like I might project onto it, you know, this is a, whatever, a healthy deer. But truth be told, I'm seeing that deer from a distance and the deer is suffering with whatever deer suffer with. I don't know. The first thing that came to mind is dysentery, but I don't think that's, that's probably the case with deer. Yeah, exactly. The deer dying in Andersonville prison during the Civil War, regardless. Um, you know, so, so there, there, there are all these different ways in which error can enter in. But error is properly so-called of a judgment. So as long as I take into account the fact that these errors in observation are possible, and then I incorporate that into the story of my judgment. Okay, so for instance, as I was walking over here, I looked up the address of the studio. And in looking up the address of the studio, I saw an email from the woman with whom I was in contact asking me for a bio and a headshot. And I said, Gregory, you're a fool because you ought to have sent that earlier. Uh, so I, reading that email, read it erroneously. I made uh, a poor observation. But I know that about myself now on account of the fact that I'm impatient and impetuous. I do that quite a bit. So I need to go back through my emails. And whenever anyone says to me, hey, you forgot to, I just say, yes, correct. You know, like I don't correct people anymore when they say you forgot to because it's almost always right. Um, so like I'm incorporating that now into the judgment, even though the observation may at a certain level be flawed. That absolutely makes sense. And, you know, in the fields of science, which, again, is a huge focus, here, there are theories that are always being improved upon based on new data, new information and, and new discovery. So just kind of, you know, expanding on that, how do you square that with objective truth claims? No, that's a great question. Uh, you, you know, you hear about these, quote unquote, paradigm shifts and that like science only advances by prosecuting a certain paradigm or prosecuting the discipline of whatever science is concerned according to this paradigm until such time as the paradigm is exhausted by the relevant data. And then you need a paradigm shift in order to account better for it. You know, so like Newtonian physics and then whatever. So you, you, you have these types of explanations. And I think that the way a lot of people hear that is, oh, okay, so the paradigms are just tools. They're neutral vis-a-vis -vis reality, if we can even speak of reality. And so they're to be used until such time as they don't work anymore, or they don't work any further, and then discarded, and then another tool picked up which may be better, but really just better according to an evolution, which could go on ad infinitum, which is a terrible prospect. Because if that's the case, like, is it possible to love, right? Is it possible to genuinely embrace your vocation? Is it possible to become a saint? Because, I mean, if all of these paradigms are to be, you know, superseded by or transcended by a future paradigm, then what are we actually doing here? Like, what are we building here? Is there any terra firma? Can I set down roots? Can I, can I contribute in a genuine way? And so I think that like 
you know, you'll hear uh, Father Thomas Davenport, for instance, who's one of my confreres who works with Dr. Keebler on certain things, um, that, that within this paradigm, there are certain things that you can prove more demonstratively, right? So, so different approaches uh, by, you know, philosophy and theology and then, you know, the empirical sciences, but you're approaching the same truth. And there are certain instances or certain methodologies according to which you can lay hold of the truth with a kind of stable and permanent certainty because you've seen the principles and the conclusions and the conclusions and the principles, and you've shown how they are related. So that's, that's science in the kind of classical sense of knowledge through causes. And when you can construe, not invent, but construe according as it is, um, a full causal picture, then you can have knowledge, right? Genuine knowledge, and you can build your life upon that rock. And that's not to say that other things, which might register more at the level of opinion, aren't real, right? But, but they're just different. And you have to be able to distinguish between this is knowledge and this is opinion, well-founded opinion, well-experimented opinion, well-substantiated opinion, but opinion nonetheless. And this is, yeah. So I, I think that requires um, a certain discipline by the practitioner. It requires a certain humility, especially in publication, to say, like, I think this is true, but it could be wrong. I'm eager to hear the results of my reviewers, so that way I can perfect it. But there are a lot of interrelated virtues. Yeah, it seems like you know, with, with science, you're per, you're you're penetrating a, a very complex reality, right? And so, um, and and you're you're doing it in a systematic way, um, and we never have access to all the information that we need to make a you know a final. So you're making the best judgment you can based on, and we do that in every aspect of our our lives, and that's why we make erroneous decisions. Many times, but it's the same thing with science, and, and and these paradigm shifts that you might see in science are not so much uh, we just throw everything out and we're going to go and we'll build this model because you like this one better, but it is oh you know it, it's almost we've developed beyond this where we take some of this and 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 move forward like Newtonian physics doesn't just disappear because we understand quantum physics, but you realize it it's got a certain usefulness and. Um, it, it 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 misses certain things on certain levels, right? And we keep building upon this sort of edifice of of, of knowledge, thinking we're getting closer to the truth, but with humility that we realize we might never get there, you know. And, and, and like with the brain, like is it is it will we ever understand how the brain works? Is it you know? It's a it's a, a real question. Is it that is the is the brain is, is something that's too complex for the human? intellect to understand it's just like a dog will never understand certain things like is there certain things that but but doesn't mean we shouldn't do science to try to penetrate that but will we ever understand consciousness from a scientific perspective we, we may never be able to figure that that out for for different reasons right um so it it, it does seem that uh you know that that there might be some limit to what you know science might be able to find not to necessarily be um, you know, there's certain questions that are beyond science, but even within science, questions that are proper to its scope, we may never be able to fully, fully get to, right? And I think it, you would see a similar thing in theology, right? We can never maybe fully penetrate and keep uh, and, and and get to the end. When does theology end, right? When does science end? Is there an end of, of, of either of those, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, in making reference to the view from nowhere, I think if there is a view from nowhere, it's God's view. In the sense that it's it's impartial or insofar as it's constitutive, right? It just is reality. So God, knowing himself, knows all things that partake of his divine life in this, that, or the other limited way, which is to say, I mean, he knows us. He knows animals. He knows plants. He knows minerals. He knows all the things. Um, and he knows them in their, interwork, or their inner workings and then their outer workings, their inner relations, as it were. Um, and I think that, okay, so like that's the truth of the matter. That's the truth, which is at the heart of reality. And the various approaches that we take with the empirical sciences, with philosophy, with theology, are accessing or are trying to access that same truth, mind you, with different starting points and according to different methodologies. I would say that the, the methodology of philosophy and theology is remarkably similar. Similar, It might, in fact, be the same. Just in theology, you start with revealed principles. So like the very knowledge of God and of the blessed. But in every case, you know, you're trying to call the things by their right names. You're trying to say of what is that it is and what is or what is not of what is not. And, and so we have a kind of confidence that truth is one, symphonic, that we're all, when speaking to the reality, provided that we do so well um, with this kind of epistemic humility that we described, that you're going to be getting towards the same truth. Um, and that also it's 
hopefully, you know, progressive. It might not look progressive over the course of humanity's whole history, but that provided we retain what is best and then build thereupon, that it has this capacity to be, you know, assimilated more and more to the divine mind, right? And to participate in the very vision of God. But on account of the fact that we're human beings, it's always going to be limited. Um, you know, God is greater than our hearts. We can say something similar like God is greater than our minds. Uh, we can't see with his vision insofar as we're made of a, an infinitely lesser stuff. And so I think that too, while it means our inquiry is broken open to the prospect of infinity, it also introduces a principle again of like patience, as it were, um, or of docility. Like we will only know so far as is revealed, whether by reality unassisted by faith or by reality assisted by faith. Um, so I think that those, again, are all, all helpful. I'm struck by the need for, you know, us to maintain humility and like you just said, docility in the search for knowledge and in our search for learning more. What, in your opinion, though, should be our, our should we have a disposition that is skeptical and questioning and do those conflict with one another? Yeah, I think, yeah, and, and Dr. Keebley, you gestured in this direction when talking about faith seeking understanding versus a kind of skeptical doubt and then an established understanding seeking whatever, a greater methodological freedom. Um, so so in, in, when, in the practice of you know, faith discourse, theology, no. Uh, because, so for instance, <laughs> I love this because it just gets me so pumped. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas, he'll, he'll you know, break the creed up into 14 propositional statements. And he says, you know, what you believe are the things through the testimony, these propositions mediate that encounter, right? I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, etc. Um, Lord, forgive thee, etc. Those things are all worth repeating. I just didn't because of time constraints. Um, but, but he'll say, if you believe, for instance, in 13 out of 14 of those propositions, but you can't abide the 14, in truth be told, you don't believe any of them. You hold them by opinion. Because the reason for which we believe is because we lean on the divine truth. We believe because God speaks truly. And either he speaks or he doesn't. And so, like, doubt is that disposition whereby you say, I'm suspended between two points, and I incline neither to the one nor to the other. Suspicion, opinion are like, I incline to the one, but I fear the other, or I suspect that the other might have some merits. But faith is a clinging to the proposition. I mean, it's a clinging to the person, the testator, and to what he reveals because it's trustworthy. And so there's still some inquiry. So like St. Augustine will say, to believe is to think with assent, but the word that he uses is cogitare, which is to cogitate, to continue to inquire, to move further up and further in, but with assent, that is to say, I lend my will to it. So I choose to believe, all right? So you have the fixity in the end, albeit with some mental unrest, but not the unrest of doubt. It's the, it's the unrest of inquiry, which is the whole faith-seeking understanding. Yeah. And that, how does that, you know, if you see that with, with science, right? Is, is there some sense where there is faith seeking understanding or is it, is, is it different? I mean, you know, not faith with a capital F, right? You know, but, um, but is there like a faith seeking understanding that you could you can tease out in science or, you know, a lot of people say, no, it's, it's, it's really science. You have to be skeptical. And then as you, you know, um, you, you get assent at the end, right? You do your experiments and then you assent to them. Um, but it, it seems that there's also some faith at the beginning, in the middle, and the end with science. And it, even though the traditional thing, oh, we're, we're skeptical, and then we do our experiment, and then we assent to it, as opposed to theology, we assent to these truths, and then we try to seek understanding. Um, and I, I think there's some parallel, there, there, there's some truth in those things, but I, I think there's more complexities with, with, with science than just, oh, we always have skepticism, and then we get the assent at the end. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you, I mean, what's your thoughts on, yeah. uh, on that? I think there's a kind of natural faith which is operative in the experimental sciences. And I think that you see that in terms of the community and in terms of the methodology. So like even though there is this, you know, repeatability or reproducibility problem, um, still, you know, like we're downstream of so many experiments and so many theories fashioned on the basis of those experiments. And if we were in a position where we had to reproduce all of those experiments and refashion all of those theories, we would never get beyond the accumulated body of knowledge. We would expend ourselves just in proving it or in, you know, like illustrating it further. So I think this idea that if we are to progress as a scientific community, we need to rely upon those who have gone before us in some way, shape or form. 
And I think there are there are different levels of trust and skepticism, different practitioners, you know, events, different levels as it were of both. Um, and then when it comes to like the methodology itself, so there's there's an implicit faith there in the coherence of reality. Because if you don't think that reality is coherent, then there's no sense approaching it with the understanding that it will yield up its intelligibility. So like if I think that, um, like for instance, if I were to talk nonsense, so if I, if I chose not to observe ordinary sentence structure, if I were to say like, cup, mirror, floor, Tuesday, advantageously, so you'd be like, you know, like you're not welcome to this conversation. And, and, and not only could I not be here because it would be poor production value, but also because like you'd be worried. You'd be like, I don't want to sit too close to this man because he could wield like a small pen knife at any moment, right? It's like once it comes undone, it comes undone. And so there's this, a significant degree of trust in the community and in the intelligibility of reality such that we actually think we can approach it with any, with any hope of it yielding the goods. Um, and so I think that you do see faith in, in scientific practitioning. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think it's true. Exactly right. And it's at, it, it's at a slightly different level. Like to do science, there is a faith that you have like in the community around you. You know, we have physicists on and we have to take on faith what they're saying. I'm not going to d- debate, you know, a particle physicist on here and tell them to, I think you're wrong because I never saw that. And I never did that math, you know, which I could never do. But, <laughs> but, but it, it is, uh, but, but then there's also the faith that you have to have, like you said, the regularity and intelligibility of nature, the repeatability, and that knowledge is something worth seeking in its own sake that men by nature want to know, right? And that is something that um, I can't prove that, you know, uh, but, but that is something that's a starting point that, that gets you going on both theological knowledge, philosophical knowledge, scientific knowledge. Um, and without just that, that truth, nothing gets, gets going intellectually, I think, right? You talk about, you know, this is a very controversial term nowadays of the, like, our nature, like what is our nature, and you, you, as if it's something that's that, that that's real. And I think that's something that it's lost on. You know, it, 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 how would you talk to somebody and say, hey, "My nature is what I, I I make my own reality. I make my own nature. There is nothing that I am drawn towards or that I need to attain to by nature. God didn't make me a certain way. I'm creating myself the way I want to create myself." Right. Uh, there isn't a good that 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 attains to me, and because of the thing that I am as a as a human person, now the good is whatever the heck I want at the time. And, and what is it that that uh, you know philosophically, theologically, you would you would provide to them to say, you know what, maybe maybe there is you know some unifying nature that we all share, you know, because it seems like that that, that that's something people just you know discount nowadays, right? Yeah. Uh, so as a theologian, I can just be irresponsible. You know, I never actually have to, to argue in coherent fashion. I can just be like, Jesus. Um, and then people are like, yes, okay. We expected you to say that. Um, so my, I mean, my go-to would be to make reference to nature's God in the sense that I don't think it makes too terribly much, you know, sense to people to say that you have a nature unless they can refer to its source. Uh, I think it begins to make sense when you see your nature as a gift. So it seems like many folks see nature as an imposition or as a violence or as a trauma or as a prison or as a whatever else. Okay, so if, if you were to describe nature just as the material conditions of your present existence, a lot of people hate that, right? Because they experience themselves as loathsome. Um, and whether that's psychological or emotional or physical, there are a lot of resonances to that. And, you know, you come before those people with a certain sympathy and with like a certain reverence insofar as each has suffered in his or her own way. Um, but it's like, y- you need to do the work of whatever, recognizing and receiving the fact that, that what is given to you is a gift. Um, and so all of creation is shot through with this note of gratuity because it could have been otherwise. Uh, it also could not have been period. So the mere fact that it is, is God vouchsafing that it's good, you know, like that it is good because it could have been otherwise and it could not have been and I think that part of our recognizing and receiving that is learning then what that entails, like the type of claim that that places on my life. So the Lord doesn't promise us positive emotions. And here I might get a little preachy. He doesn't, he doesn't promise us like physical integrity or emotional balance or psychological equilibrium. He promises us himself. And the terms according to which we come into possession of him is our nature. 
<laughs> well, it's always good for the order of preachers to get preachy. Yeah. I appreciate it. One question I want to ask that I think would be especially relevant to anyone who's listening and watching this is, you know, we live in an age of information overload. You know, we have access to more information than ever before, accessible at our fingertips. Yet we see a proliferation of conspiracy theories um, and blatant misinformation. You know, that is a more recent modern term. What are the challenges to the sheer volume of information today when it comes to our ability to strive to know higher things and to know just in our search for knowledge? So, yeah, I think that knowledge is a good, but it's a good address to us who are weak and wounded, right? Limited at the very least, weak and wounded in our present historical realization. And so I think that knowledge needs to be incorporated within a culture of, you know, human flourishing. So for instance, like when St. Thomas Aquinas talks about the acquisition of knowledge, he says that there's a virtue which informs our desire for knowledge, which he calls studiositas. And he says there's a vice opposed to it, which he calls curiositas. And he says that our desire for knowledge can go off the rails in a variety of ways. He says, one, if we don't refer it to God. Two, if we supplant the study of higher things in preference for lower things. Three, if we neglect those things which pertain to our vocation. Four, if we go about it by the wrong means. And he says, by necromancy and sortilage. And you're like, woo! Um, but like, the point isn't just to know. The point is to know within the setting of an integral human culture, right? Because I can know lots of trivial things and I could still be a total bore. Like we could gather around the, you know, small dinner table and eat our five guys um, burgers. And you could be like, you know, uh, Dr. Keebler, I had this question about thus and such. And then I could launch and be like, well, actually, and then I could correct you for the next 17 minutes. And you'd be like, you knew that thing, but I also hate you. And you'd be appropriate in making that judgment. Um, so it's like, wh when it comes to knowledge, I, I don't think that we can presume that the access that we have to knowledge and that the use that we make of knowledge is necessarily good because we're dealing with knowledge right? Even if there's an admixture of error or there's a potential admixture of error. Um, because like the fact that we all have phones in our pockets and we have access to chat GPT means like the trivia just doesn't matter that much. A, a computer can do it better than you can. So, so what do you bring to the table? You bring the love, right? Like you bring the human culture, you bring the aspirations for beatitude, whereby this knowledge takes up a place in your actual transformation. And so, you know, that's, that's true of theology in a peculiar way, that's true of philosophy, that's true of the empirical sciences. Like, um, if you're a great researcher and you advance the body of knowledge, that's awesome. If you can teach students, you know, that's awesome. If you can do both, that's incredible, right? Uh, if you can actually incorporate and introduce others into that conversation, into that inquiry in such a way that they see it as pertaining not only to the good of humanity in some vague generic sense, but to their own good. Like, they're a building as practitioners of the science and being honest about it and humble in it that they can become better human, like that's, that's nuts. The science is not some uh, abstract thing, right? It's a human enterprise. It's, it's, it, it only um, obtains the good if humans are using it and that knowledge in a way that is uh, in accord with their, their nature and, and, and bringing them uh, and fulfill it towards a higher purpose, right? It, it, it seems that this is what I think, you know, maybe, how does theology help inform science, right? It, you know, we don't want science to become uh, a theology. We don't want theology to become modern science, right? But how does theology help inform and, and allow modern science to be what it is more fully, right? It, 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 and this seems to be what you're getting at there, right? That, uh, the, that science is um, uh, done with the perspective of what the human person really is and what the value of knowledge is you know, um, actually, uh, and there's a relation there, right? That, that, that science is a community and it's done for a greater community and a greater good, right? Uh, which I think um, uh, people often miss <laughs> because they just, you know, follow the science or the science has this, you know, uh, some, you know, again, it's science from nowhere. This, you know, the science has got the perspective, just follow it. But yeah, and I think, I mean, like often enough, what you're doing is just, pushing back against a reductive anthropology or checking scientism where it crops up. Uh, so like theology, philosophy and th theology have the capacity to say, stay in your lane, yeah, right. you know. Um, and mind you, philosophy and theology can get out of their own lane. And so it's appropriate for modern science to say like, ooh, you overexplained that. Ooh, you presumed on that knowledge. Ooh, you know, 
So if, if the truth is genuinely symphonic, then two, these two different disciplines, you know, prosecuted according to their methodological bounds will yield up, you know, a, a harmonic result. So what do you think is, um, you know, in, in modern culture, this, this conflict between science and faith, what is underlying that? Where's the, what's the, the ultimate source of that from your perspective? Not like the specific issue, you know, oh, it's evolution, it's this, but what's the sort of the mindset that leads to this uh, popular perception that, hey, the two must be in conflict. They're coming from different places and there's no way to get them to fit together. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think a lot of that is bad bad practicing, as it were, um, both on both sides. I don't think it's a matter of just pointing the blame at others. I think you've seen that historically in, in both disciplines. And as a result of which you have a deep, deep undermining of trust, like across the aisle, although that doesn't necessarily apply in this conversation as it does in political conversations. But um, yeah, I think like you'll see people going beyond their methodological bounds and speaking with a certainty on matters which don't pertain to the proper zone or sphere of their certainty. So on the one, like science, scientism kind of devolves into scientism and then faith devolves into a certain fideism, uh, which is unsubstantiated by the revelation of God or the genuine facts of the matter. And so it's like, for instance, now when people turn on the news, they make a judgment as to what they want to believe because they go to those news sources, which say the things that they are better inclined to hear. And uh, they tend to look with scorn and you know mockery on news sources that come from another perspective and truth be told it's it's understandable why that's the case because it seems like both media like media or journalistic outfits have given up on the truth and they've they've begun doing something different it's like cheerleading or it's like campaigning or it's like something else but it's not it doesn't strike me as even handed journalism in many in many senses uh present company excluded um so so then uh, once you begin to shift genres, then and you don't signal that to people, then you really do lose them and you undermine their trust. So, like for instance, when I preach, I'm often asserting, and when I'm asserting, I need to be sure of what I'm saying. Uh, when I when I explain something in more like while well, teaching, I try to signal this is revealed by the church. I'm saying this because Saint Thomas Aquinas says this, but this is a space of theological speculation, and I'm just making this part up. You know, like you need to know when I'm just making this part up because sometimes I say a thing because it sounds pretty. And then afterwards, I'll think to myself, I think that's true. I hope that's true. Or maybe that's false. So I think that one has to be honest about what he in fact knows or believes and then how he extrapolates from that or how he expounds upon that. And then the types of things which are kind of table conversation. Um, and I think that, you know, that's a kind of a crass way of putting it, but when science does science and then admits, okay, these are things beyond science, but things that I'm interested in perhaps. And then when faith does faith and then says, okay, well, this is what's been established within this confessional community on the basis of these principles with these criteria, and we can know it according to that. And as a result of which, if we go beyond that, then we're in a space of more like speculation or opining. And I think if we were to do that, just be honest about our sources, the reason for which we hold to them, and then our practicing of the whatever, you know, whatever discipline, and then what we yield as a result, I think that we'd have an easier time. So one of the things that I say most frequently and which are liberating words to pronounce are, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay to not know at all. You know, Father Gregory, we're so grateful for your time. Before we let you go, did you have any final thoughts or takeaways on this topic as we grapple with how do we know what we know? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe just to expound further upon that last point. I think that the genuineness or sincerity of inquiry, I mean, we've made such an idol of genuineness and sincerity, but the honesty of inquiry can itself be a light um, and it helps others to illumine their own experience. And, and I think that in parts, because when you admit what you know and what you don't know within the proper and stated bounds without trying to manipulate or control either the data or the people to whom you address it, you welcome them into a space of exchange. And I think that that's, that illumines their experience and it also illumines your, you know, kind of corporate human enterprise. And it's like, yeah, sometimes I, 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 I take great delight in having conversations with people who just want to have a conversation, not in the sense of like, this is an end oriented discourse. We can all just say whatever we want and it's free space. Like there's always, there's always something of an end and the discourse is always oriented in some way to it. But like, yeah, there's something about just kind of peeling back the calluses 
uh, or, you know, scrubbing away the gunk that's gotten in the way of that desire to know, which I think poses obstacles to our exchanges. And insofar as we can do the work uh, to make that progress, I think that we'll be we'll be better off. Father Gregory Pine, thank you so much for your time. My joy. Thanks for having me. Again, I think you can see why he is such a beloved contributor to so many podcasts and is a guest who's so knowledgeable, but really broke it down for us in a, in a way that I knew I could understand. Yeah, his examples are great. He brings home uh, deep philosophical points with with concrete examples I think people can, re- can relate to and, and make sense out of. Something that really stood out to me was his distinction that you know, in growing deeper in our knowledge of the faith and growing closer to God, there we need to have submission, you know, completely. But when it comes to science and seeking, there does need to be skepticism. Yeah, there is a healthy dose of, of skepticism in the practice uh, of, of the day-to-day practice of science that you don't jump to your conclusions until you have the data to back it up. Um, although to do science, you you do have to have the sort of faith in certain things, even get off the ground. But once you start doing it, there's a danger if you assent to certain things without the evidence, because then you start believing things that uh, you just can't support um, with the with the scientific evidence. You know, something I didn't expect, but took note of was again how he weaved in the importance of virtues in this search for knowledge as well. You know, humility, patience, docility; these are key in our search for knowledge. Yeah, and, and, and particularly in, in scientific knowledge, that, that, that patients are not jumping ahead of the data and making conclusions that you can't uh, make yet or aren't supported by the data. Um, and that it's okay to say, I don't know, and it's a part of humility, but... And uh, even a scientist, you have to recognize, okay, these are my biases. This is you know my political bias, my religious bias, and so forth, um, and put those on the table and say, okay, this is the data. This is how those biases might influence it. And to consciously try to check those things, which I, we don't do a very good job in our society doing that now. And I think another important statement that he made at one point was the fact that all men by nature desire to know. I made a note of that because um, that's really key to, to every single one of us. Yeah, and that that I think that that counters that radical skepticism that often comes into society. No, we we do need we do desire to know, and I think you know if you're you know raising children, if your child doesn't want to know, you recognize there's something lacking there. You know, like asking all those why what, questions. Right, right. That's yeah. that that's how we come out. We're wired to try to figure out what's going on. Right. We want to know. Um, and and uh, that uh, we all want to, um, you know, that there that, that there is something common that we share, the common nature, as he was talking about it. That then, you know, we want to know what really exists, rather than everybody creating their own truth. No, there's this, this unity that we have to try to understand the world around us and make a coherent sense of it. And that requires is a community that is sort of working together and having faith in that community. That, we're trying to make sense of the world together and different disciplines and trying to make sense of that world together in different ways. And, and again, the learning community and, and uh, that, 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 that's needed to do that. Um, I'm grateful that as we're asking these big questions, as we do, that we got a Dominican on the show, too. I think he was really helpful and then really grateful, again, to Father Gregory Pine. Yeah. And it's good, you know, is getting back to the first principles. And we all have to start with, and it was the point he made, there's certain first principles that... Uh, we, we, we take before we get started with any scientific inquiry, theological inquiry, philosophical inquiry, whether you're an atheist, there's certain things you take for granted. If you're a theist, there's certain things you take for granted to start your investigation of the world um, that uh, you don't necessarily prove, but as he was pointing out, they get um, verified based upon your experience. Uh, you know, and I think, uh, I think it's C.S. Lewis you know, said, I don't believe in God um, like I believe in the sun because I can see it, but because through that I can see everything else. It sort of makes sense as you know for for, for a, uh, a theist to think that there's a God. Well, that resonates with what I see in the order and the structure and and so forth in the world, right? Um, and and that I think is what he's talking about. These first principles, um, some of them, you know, f- um, are more fruitful I think than others. Yeah. Foundational and a necessary lens as we ask these yeah. questions. Right. So here we are throughout Purposeful Lab, throughout this project, grappling with and asking the question, is there purpose in the universe? But is that even a question that can be answered with certainty? Yeah, you know, that's uh, something that Father uh, Gregory hit upon, you know, um, that there are certain things like 
we can know with certainty, like two plus two is four, these mathematical certainties that we have. That doesn't mean that anything else is, we just have to be skeptical <laughs> of that. These are the only things we can know, but we can know other things, maybe not with that degree of, of, of certainty. Now, uh, questions of purpose, like, yeah, you know, is there purpose in the universe? Do we have purpose? That's not something we can know scientifically. But as we reflect on the nature of, you know, consciousness, the universe, you know, as he said, the nature of, of, of humans, that we want to know things, these, 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 these patterns that we see, um, we can come to um, a realization that uh, uh, make a good argument for there being purpose. It, it, it's not going to be an argument two plus two equals four that I can show everybody, everybody's going to you know, agree to and assent to. But just like I can't uh, do that with uh, most things in my life, I can't argue with certainty that my wife loves me, even though you know it's a thing you have to you have evidence for. Um, but it's not something I can know with certainty and prove mathematically. Just like you can't pr- prove, I think, purpose mathematically in the way f- philosophically. But we've seen a lot of these, you know, patterns and so forth in the order there, and even just in human nature, we have this um, the, this commonality that we all share. Are it, it suggests that we're meant for something. And that brings us to the office hour segment of the podcast where we can ask Dr. Dan Keebler about what he knows now that we know how we know and what we know and what have you. So this was a this was a user submitted question on our YouTube page, actually, in one of our videos. And it's pretty basic biology question. Do we need to have water for life to exist and why? Yeah, it's a interesting and a, a really good question. It's not one we know with certitude going back to what we talked about on the podcast today. But um, you know, this I, I think relates to you know if, if we found life on other planets, people will assume well, there's probably going to be water there. So we look for where's water in the universe, and okay, well, if there's water there, maybe life could evolve there. And that maybe you know people question is that anthropocentric thinking that oh, well, if life evolved with water here, it has to evolve with water everywhere else. And no, that's that's not the case. It could use another liquid. But the things about water, water is an extremely unique. Uh, liquid. I mean, it uh, stays liquid at uh, a large range of temperatures. So things like ethanol, another liquid, but that evaporates at a much lower temperature. So um, it, it has a narrower range that it could be, you know, life that was based on ethanol would have a narrow temperature range than life based on water. And water is a very good solvent. So many things can dissolve in water. Not as much can dissolve, say, in ethanol or other liquids. So that would mean it, 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 it could, but it gives life a huge handicap, right? Um, that it, you know, th- it, certain things wouldn't dissolve in it, which means molecules won't be able to interact as well, and it would evaporate, which would be deadly to to, to life. So that's why we we um, uh, uh, people look for water as a sign of uh, where to look for where life might have emerged. That said, it could have. Could have happened else, uh, uh, but but it certainly seems, um, and I would uh, argue that it would be more difficult, much more difficult with 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 another liquid. As you're speaking, I'm I'm reminded how much I desperately need to drink water today. So thanks for that hydration reminder. Um, and the second question is: This is more of a personal question for you. Is do you have a favorite science fiction novel as a as a Catholic? Gosh, yeah. Scientist? Just as a disclaimer, I'm not a huge science fiction fan. Um, you know, I. Uh, I, uh, you know, my, I, I tend to read more uh, uh, science and faith books, more dry <laughs> stuff. Uh, but um, my favorite science fiction novel is uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, Paralandra, which is the book that looks at, uh, I think it was the planet Venus uh, as uh, um, a planet where um, uh, you have this extraterrestrial life that uh, existed uh, before the fall. So what would the life look like if there wasn't the fall and sin hasn't been introduced? I think it's an interesting sort of you know, a thought exercise, and that's why I really uh, like C.S. Lewis is a great writer, and that's why I like uh, that book because of the theological and philosophical implications there. But uh, that that would be my favorite one. Um, it, 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 uh, I, but it's a very small subset of all the science fiction books that I've read in my life. Yeah, that's a good recommendation, and I think you know for listeners and viewers that they have a favorite, I think we'd love to hear from that as well. You can comment on our social media; we'd love to hear that as well. But Dan, that takes us to the end of this episode. Again, really fascinating conversation. And I want to let our listeners and viewers know there is a way for you to send in your question for Office Hours. And you can hear your voice right here on the podcast if you send an audio message at 949-257-2436. We have that number on the screen as well and in our show notes. We'd love to hear from you. As always, find out all the latest on the podcast at magicenter.com. We'll see you next time.